LinkedIn strategies for professional services, unlocking client acquisition. Join us as Ed, who's the author of No More Cringe, reveals some effective LinkedIn strategies to build meaningful connections, improve client acquisition, and avoid some of the common networking pitfalls. You'll discover the importance of authentic engagement and some practical tips you won't want to miss for maximizing LinkedIn's potential. There's also bonus content, which you can access via the link in the show notes on how to get a 70% LinkedIn connection acceptance rate. And I can tell you, if you're out there, you're getting a lot less than that. So you won't want to miss that bit of bonus content. Then there is so much more that you've got in this very jam-packed episode. Get your notepads out, get ready, let's get into BizBytes. Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of BizBytes, proudly brought to you by Com Together, the people behind podcasts done for you, because we're all about exposing other people's brilliance. Don't forget to subscribe to BizBytes and check out podcasts done for you as well in the show notes. Now, let's get into it. Well, hello everyone and welcome to Biz Bites. I have a wonderful guest today and I'm encouraging everybody to make sure that they stay tuned to this one because if you're in business, you cannot miss this. This is absolutely critical stuff. Um, I've been talking to Ed for a little while now and um, I've read most of his book and we're going to talk about that no more cringe in a little while. But firstly, I want to welcome Ed to the program. Anthony, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Absolute pleasure. And look, there's so many things that we're going to talk about, and a lot of it's going to revolve around LinkedIn. But first of all, I wanted to just ask you to introduce yourself to everyone. Sure. Thank you. I was uh, born in the 60s, only child. Uh, My father was a colonel in the army. And back in the 60s, we watched television. At least I did. That was my main uh, entertainment. I watched it a lot. My mother, my father died when I was young. I I was four years old when he died. And so my mother had to raise me on her own. Uh, She saw that I really loved TV, but wanted me to, if I'm going to watch TV, I should earn it. So she bought a lot of different puzzles and these math uh, problem uh, books for me to solve math problems. And she said, you can watch all the TV you want, but you either have to solve a puzzle or you have to go through one chapter and fill out all the math questions before you can watch TV. So I became a really good problem solver, which is, I think, the reason why I have two engineering degrees. Um, I think I was about 12. And our new neighbor invited us over her home. We had dinner, and then she brought out this board game. Uh, It was called Landslide. It's a a game that um, it's a uh, it simulates a presidential election, and you have to get to two hundred and seventy electoral votes to win. I didn't know anything about politics. I was twelve years old, but there was math involved, which I liked, and it seemed like a puzzle to, to kind of figure out how to win. I failed miserably the first time, uh, but I liked the game and I asked my mother to buy it. And I just played that game by myself for hours and hours and hours on end. And I discovered that there were different paths to get to enough points to win the game. So then when I started playing my friends, I'd have my notes next to me and I'd have my paths already determined. And as we were playing, as a path got taken away, I switched to another one, but I always won the game. I, I never lost after that first time. The reason why I bring that up is because many times when someone's starting a business, there is one path that they follow with two different methods. It's either referrals or networking. And usually at some point that dries up. So then they maybe they get on LinkedIn and they do the same thing. They have two methods, one path. Those methods are, that method is usually one of them, text posts or cold DMs or combination of, of the two. There are 16 different, I've identified 16 different ways to get a client on LinkedIn. Text posts and cold DMs, number 14 and 15 on the list as far as effectiveness. So they are doing low probability things expecting to get a client. It's no wonder so many people fail. There are 65,519 different paths to get 
a client on LinkedIn. So what I do with people is I say, let's figure out which one of these 16 things that you feel comfortable doing. We'll then figure out what it, in, in what combination provides you the best probability of getting a client. And we'll do that. If one fails, we have other paths that we can choose. And when, when they understand that, they now have confidence that they can get a client. I go, all we're going to do is get one client. And then we're going to repeat that over and over and over again. And we're going to have one path that we know really works really well. And then we'll have some alternative paths that we'll follow and we can adjust them a little bit. But once they do that, the biggest, I think the biggest thing that they get from going through that exercise with me is. Hey, we hope you're enjoying listening to the Biz Bites podcast. Have you ever thought about having your own podcast, one for your business where your brilliance is exposed to the rest of the world. Well, come talk to us at Podcast Done For You. That's what we're all about. We even offer a service where I'll anchor the program for you. So all you have to do is show up for a conversation. But don't worry about that. We will do everything to design a program that suits you from the strategy right through to publishing and of course, helping you share it. So Come talk to us, podcastdoneforyou.com.au. Details in the show notes below. Now, back to BizBytes. Confidence in knowing that they can get a client. So it's a lot easier than most people think, and you don't have to put so much pressure on yourself. There is so much truth in what you're saying there. And uh, if I can just pick it up for the sake of people who are listening, who are sort of nodding their head about networking meetings and things where you know, you, you go through these ideas of, um, and, and I think what's typical about networking meetings and what happens on LinkedIn as well is people go in expecting immediate results that they'll walk into the room and immediately people will say, ah, you're just what I was looking for. Where do I sign up? And when was the last time that actually <laughs> happened to anybody? Like never. And never. yet, and yet, how many messages do we all get on LinkedIn with people we've never met before? The first thing they do is, please buy my services. Here's a list of all of the stuff that I've done. When can we talk? I'm like, D what's the conversation? Where did we start? Did you even know if I needed your services in the first place? Like, I, I, you know, I wish I had a dollar for every time that happened to me. It is crazy how that works. It reminds me of, of a friend my wife and I have. Um, she was a librarian and, uh, she thought she was going to get married to everybody that kind of looked at her, like, like the pizza, de pizza delivery guy dropped off a pizza. And she's telling us about her future with this pizza delivery guy because he bought her, brought her food. I go, that's his job. He's the pizza delivery guy. Well, he smiled at me. You gave him a tip. That's why he was smiling. But that's the way people act. As soon as someone gives someone a little bit of attention, like they accept a connection request. Oh, I've got a new client. They're talking about the future, how long they're going to be working with them, what they're going to be doing. Let's meet for 15 minutes so we can get this started. It doesn't work that way. It's And it's the same, isn't it, that we're trained in this idea on, on and we're going to focus on LinkedIn, uh, but it happens on other social platforms as well is that we're so focused on that number of how many people have actually bothered to click like, how many people have made a comment on it. And most of those people are not your clients, strangely. Very few people. In fact, if you look at the numbers, uh, when you post, and, and, and this is coming from looking at my numbers and uh, a lot of my clients' numbers, LinkedIn only shows your, your post to between two and a half to 20% of your first level connections. And most, most of the time it's between two and a half and 5%. So a very small percentage of your connections are ever going to see your post. And most people only have about 10%. And that's, that's being generous of their connections that are in their target market. So it's, we're talking about a really, really small slice of people that are going to see your post unless you do something to make sure that you put, you're putting your post in front of them, it, they're most likely never going to see it. And it's such a, a, an interesting thing. We don't, we don't think about that, but yet when you go and look at your own feed, you wonder sometimes about the stuff that's coming to you. I know there's um, in, in my feed, there's one person that I've been seeing in that feeds for years. And once in a while I'll click like on it, 
but what that person does is actually not really relevant to me. They happen to be a former colleague. So I have, you know, I, I like the person uh, as, as an individual. We actually haven't spoken for quite a number of years, but somehow it's in my feed all the time. Now I can't really control that. I don't, you know, and that's interesting if that's happening to me. And that's just one example because there's several of those. Imagine what's happening with your own stuff. So, you know, putting it out there and just hoping that it's going to get lots of traction. That is a, you know, it's a real hit and miss strategy. It really is. You cannot depend on the algorithm to help you build your business. You just can't. LinkedIn's not in the business of helping you build their business. They're in the business of driving revenue. And their primary methods of driving revenue is Sales Navigator. Uh, so the monthly subscription there, which most people don't use very well, even though they have the subscription, or paid ads. Uh, you, they're not going to stay in business for very long. They, they wouldn't be in business this long if they were to give away free traffic and put your best prospects in front of your content. It, it just wouldn't work for them. That's the right reason why they don't do it. Yeah, I mean, their philosophy has to be, we want you to try harder. We want you to keep trying and keep trying harder. Uh, we'll give you enough to make you, tease you that it's that it's that uh, you're going to get somewhere, but not, yep. not enough to you know, completely be life-changing because otherwise if we did that, then as you say, there's no revenue left for them. And I think that's the, that's the interesting thing about it is that the whole way LinkedIn is structured is in their favor. You know, the house wins is absolutely the philosophy, right? Yep. Yep. Absolutely. That's for sure. That's, it, that's exactly the way it works. But I think the, the point that you make as well is that there are ways to engage with people and it's not just about posting. Posting is one part of it. And I, and I think a, a lot of people get that wrong. I, you know, I keep playing with the way I post as well. Um, but getting that magical post that goes to, you know, whatever the pick the number, uh, hundreds, thousands, whatever your tens of thousands, whatever you think is relevant to your audience. It's so hard to get there on that. And, unpredictable as you say with the algorithm and uh, you know in, in my experience most people at linkedin don't know what the algorithm is doing so the chances that you'll know are you know a million to one at, at best it, it definitely is a mystery it is a mystery uh the way i approach it is i take the algorithm which is a, a variable that i don't control out of the equation and actually use what LinkedIn allows us to do to my advantage. So I'm getting my content in front of the right people. And I'm able to, um, it's like I, I say all the time, it's easier to make a friend than, than to make a sale. And so I'm, I approach it in a way that is re very relaxed, but I'm just out there making friends. And so it makes it a lot easier to do business once your mindset is, I'm just trying to make a friend. I'm not trying to make a sale. Just because somebody said uh, accepting my connection request does not mean that they want to be a client. What I find really interesting about what you've said there is that this is coming from someone whose background is in sales, right? That's that's indeed. You know, <laughs> and so, and so, you you know, is there this inner conflict? Because you know, as a salesperson, don't you want to just go out and sell? It is. Uh, in fact, I have quite a few clients that are in sales and they're always asking me, well, when do I start selling? When do I start selling? I said, we, we're not going to sell. Uh, and they go, well, how am I supposed to make any money? You're going to be fine. What we're going to do is we're going to make friends and then we're going to get that new connection to discover your content. And once they do that, and they've done three things, they've become comfortable with you, they trust you, and they're confident that you can do what you say, uh, then they'll do business with you. But you can't skip steps. Most people want to skip to, well, let's do business. Well, you skipped over comfort and trust. Uh, they're not going to, well, they may do business with you if they're desperate. That's not the greatest client to have because if everything's got to go right if you're going to keep them. And they're probably going to be very, very difficult along the way. But once you have comfort and trust and confidence, 
then you can make mistakes and they'll be very forgiving because they know that you can help them get to the end goal. And it's more of a collaboration than them just handing everything over to you and say, okay, you do it and uh, make things happen for me. Yeah. So I, I think that this whole approach of being friends first is a really interesting one. And um, I don't want to give away the whole book. Um, there's lots of things in in the book. No more cringe. I love the title, by the way. So let's just let's just talk about that for starters, because I think that's the basis of the whole idea. Is that when you're making friends with someone, you you, you don't want to be cringy, and yet, how many times do you find yourself when you're reaching out to people being exactly that? Uh, I was thinking only the other day that. How do I actually type an introductory message to someone that doesn't sound like it's either cringy or written by an AI, even though it's genuinely me writing it? It's so difficult to, mm -hmm. to do that. And I think you flipped that completely on its head. So, but tell me what encouraged the, the title. How did, uh, how did that come about? And then let's get into the whole cringe factor. That actually was, we were talking about viral posts. Uh, it became uh a series of posts that I did that did very well. And my best performing post talked about, do you like there were polls and there were posts uh, about people reaching out to them after you connect? And everybody agreed. Um, well, not everybody. The people that want to sell, they thought it was okay. But over 80% of people said, I hate it when people do that. I don't like it when they start pitching or they start spamming my inbox or they ask me for a 15 minute appointment. I just met you. I don't know anything about you. You don't know anything about me. Why would I meet you for 15 minutes? And because there was, it was, there was so much emotion in the comments that I got, I realized that I was onto something. I should cover, I should talk about this process. And so I talk about the seven cringy methods that are out there and everybody can relate to any one of the seven because they've probably been approached in that way. And they probably used one of them because they didn't know any better. Uh, but there has to, I figured there has to be a better way. And the way you work things in networking, if you, well, I look at it as a client has more value or, or a connection has more value than just potentially being a client. They could be a referral partner. They could be a collaboration part partner, which is more valuable than being a client because they could bring in several clients to you. Or they could just be a friend, somebody that supports your content and you support them. And if you go, if you proceed in, with that mindset, then you really can't lose because most people are, are happy to be friends and they're happy to support each other's content. Yeah, I think that's an important um, idea, isn't it? Because too often it is a very one-sided thing. It's someone pushing, as you say, for the 15-minute uh, meeting. Um, and <clears throat> it's a very one-sided idea that that is um, uh, what people are want and willing to give up their time. And, and that 15-minute meeting often is very forced because you're going into that with this idea that I'm going to see if this person really needs my services or otherwise I'll tick them off the list. And it's a, it's a very, um, uh, I, I guess, a very sales driven approach. And yet that's kind of the opposite of what most people who are on LinkedIn actually really want to do. But yet that's the trap they fall into. For sure. For sure. And I think what ends up happening is, uh, like you said, the 15 minute meeting, uh, usually it's framed as uh, let's meet and greet or let's get to know one another. But it's a sales meeting. And let's be honest, it, it usually is a sales meeting. And that puts pressure on you if you have to try to make a sale in 15 minutes and it puts pressure on the other person. So it ends up being awkward all the time as opposed to I don't have an agenda right now. I'm just trying to make a friend. And then I'm going to see like where this leads. And I, I talk in terms of roles that people will have. There are one role could be they just their friends and that's fine. And when they see your content, they'll read it and like it. Uh, and, and that's as far as it'll go. Or is, is we work with them, like I, I call them work friends is you begin working with somebody and you get to know them. So you get comfortable with them. You, you, you begin to trust them. As you see their content, you don't have to sell anything because they're looking at your content and they see what you're doing. 
uh, they see other people commenting on your post and you know, that's social proof that you, you know what you're doing. When they have the problem that you can solve, uh, especially if they've been commenting on your post, they're going to be congruent with what their public statements are, and they're most likely going to do business with you. It's rare when they don't. That COVID catching up to you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Um, one of the things that you said in the book that I think really struck out to me was we live in a permission society, and I think that that is lost on a lot of people because as we've been talking about, there is this people forcing themselves um, through their messaging onto people. And it goes completely against the way people feel. You're right. It, and it's what I found was if you can ask somebody first, right, would you like to connect? Uh, would you be open to supporting each other's content? I like your content. You like mine. Uh, they're willing to go along. If you're, if you want to get them on your email list, you ask them, Hey, can I put you on my email list? But you've got to frame it different than that because just the sound of that makes it seem like, Oh, I'm going to pitch you an email now. Uh, can I update you with things that I come across? I think you may be of interest, maybe of interest to you. Uh, maybe I, I see a motivational quote or I saw a, a new app that you can, you can use to help you with a part of your business. And most people are okay with that. Uh, the emails sequences that I help set up for clients, we we use the power of the PS to remind people what we do. But we're talking about stuff that they would have an interest in, like a motivational quote or a product that's, that, that they, they could use or something that's happening in the news that may affect their business or some government regula regulation that they're unaware of. Uh, and so they'll read those emails and it's something that a friend might send to them as opposed to somebody who's trying to market them something. And I think that speaks to, I'm going to, I'm going to read another quote from your book. Uh, and I don't want to do a lot of this because I don't want to stop people from reading the book themselves oh, okay. and getting what they want out of it. But, but this really, I think, goes to the heart of what you were saying. Give people an opportunity to become familiar with you, not just as an expert in your field, but also as a person. When you do that, selling becomes superfluous. I just That's absolute gold, isn't it? Uh, and, and true. And true. It's, I think people get so caught up in business, but we do business with people at the end of the day. And so once they get to know you as a person, uh, they'll get comfortable with you. I, I don't know whether you're going to ask me this question or not, but um, one of the things when we talk about posting and, and cold DMing and what in the 16 different methods you can use to get a client, the one that's at the top of the list, the top method is engaging with somebody else's content. And the reason for that is they care about that content more than they care about ours. So if we're supporting them in their content, liking it, commenting on it, making a comment that draws them into a conversation, asking them a question about it, sharing it with others, uh, we have done something that very few people have, and they notice. Whether it's a like or it's a comment, I don't care how big a uh, uh, following somebody has, they notice. When you repost somebody's post. I don't care, again, how big their network is, they notice. And it's just, it, just those simple acts of doing that get you to a point where they can get comfortable with you, they want to know you, and then at some point they may end up doing business with you. I think what is uh, the precursor to all of that is also that you, um, is also doing the research, isn't it? Because it's, you have to be reaching the right people. And I think most of us, if you look through your own LinkedIn connections, you probably don't know 70, 80% of the people in the first place. And if you were really being serious about going through it and uh, looking, are they your ideal clients? You probably eliminate at least 50% in one go, but nobody wants to do that because you'll want to seem to have you, you know, like you've got thousands of people that, that you're friends with. And, uh, but, but I think this, whilst you might not want to change what's happened in the past, moving forward, you do want to do that, don't you? You want to be able to do the research and to get that right. So what are you, what are your tips around getting the research right and what people need to be doing? Well, there's a couple of different paths that they, they can take. Uh, I like to find people that have problem symptom awareness. 
So not they may not be aware of the problem, but they're aware of a, the symptom of a problem. I'll give you an example. And email deliverability, which is one of the things that we do, uh, people are getting their emails are going into spam, uh, and they may not know why. Uh, that is a, a problem symptom of something that's bigger, like the cause of what the problem is. So they may be um, uh, unaware of the big problem. They see there's problem symptom awareness. I heard see that some of my emails are going into spam, but they may dismiss that until you come in as an expert. Uh, after they've gotten to know you, they're comfortable with you. Uh, and you tell them, well, that is that possibly could be a bigger problem you may want to look into because you may have a problem with one of the mailbox providers that are blocking all of your emails. And I, I'd be happy to look into it and see if that's the case. At that point, what happens is a couple of different things. Um, number one, you help frame the problem and the, the solution for them instead of them framing it. Uh, I'll give you another quick example. Uh, it probably this, this is the case in Australia. If you want to buy a car, you can go on the internet, you can do all your research, you can find the best price for the model and the color of the car that you want, and you can even have it delivered to you. That puts a, a, a burden on the local dealers because if, now if you go around to the local dealers, you know they have to match the exact price that you know you can get somewhere else in the country because they can deliver the car at that price. You've already determined your buying criteria at that point, and it, nobody can change it. But if you can catch that person before they've formed that buying criteria, and maybe you recommended someone that they could go see, and oh, he's a really good, he took care of us, he did a great job, the, 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 the dealership did a great good job with us, we love the car salesperson, you go to him, and now he can form your buying criteria because you haven't had a chance to form it yet. And that's why we want to meet people there. So that's one area that we can meet somebody if we can identify problem symptom awareness that they may have or just a problem symptom. The other thing, which is a little easier, a lot easier to do, is you take your best clients and you 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 break down their their uh, profile and you determine like, like everything about them how old they are, how long they've been in the business, how many employees they have, how big the business is, how much, how much money they make. And let's say if you're working with accountants, one accountant's going to have the same problems that another accountant has. So you know that you can go after those accountants that are a lot like your client, and they probably have the same problems. And, and, and if you're aware of the problem symptom awareness that your client has, the other, uh, other people, those prospects, have that same problem symptom awareness. So you can go in and then frame their buying criteria so that you are the person that they end up working with. Yeah, uh, and that is so um, insightful in that whole idea of the problem symptom. And I think it's something that is, a, is not always easy to understand what that is. You know, I've done similar kind of thinking, you know, um, my uh, podcast done for you option, where, you know, it's easy to jump in and say, to talk to people who have been thinking about a podcast. And really, they just don't know how to go about it. And therefore, okay, I can come and I can help you. But mm -hmm. it's actually the the symptom is actually a lot is a lot harder, because there's a lot of people that have never even occurred to them to have a podcast. And the symptom is really that they think more people should know how great they are, but they have no <laughs> idea that, uh, you know, they're not getting enough business. I mean, it's probably better to frame it in that way that they're, that they're not getting enough business and they wonder why the competition is getting more when they think, well, we're just as good. You know, we've got the expertise here. Why are they getting more attention and we're not? Mm -hmm. There can be any number of reasons why they might be, but it's a question of what you can do about it. But it's actually quite a difficult thing to nudge that into you know, and, and to see to people and take them from that idea of this of the symptom that they're aware of to a solution that you have. It, it isn't. It isn't easy. Uh, you do have to do a lot of research, 
there used to be some filters you could use on LinkedIn that would help you more closely identify it. Like you used to be able to do, I mean, you can still do this where you go into uh, the LinkedIn search on regular LinkedIn, LinkedIn and you can type in different um, keyword phrases of a problem symptom awareness that somebody might have. And they may be asking about it. Uh, they may be um, in the comments. They may be saying something about it. They may be posting about it. And that's one way to find people. Another way is uh, people that are attending events, um, free LinkedIn events about a specific problem. Um, then again, you can go through that list and find people, all right, they're trying to solve this problem. Part of the problem is, is that their buying criteria is being formed by somebody else. So you have to figure out how to, based on the buying criteria that they've already formed, how do you come into the picture uh, and sell your solution? What angle can you bring to the table that maybe corrupts the thinking that they had and makes them reset their thinking? So like, oh, well, maybe that's, I didn't even think of that. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, and then they start asking you questions. Well, how would that work? So when you hear those types of responses, you know, okay, I've done my job. I, I have kind of corrupted their, their, their buying criteria and I'm going to help them form a new buying criteria. And it's it, to my advantage, but also to their advantage. You don't want to, it's, it's easy to manipulate people. Uh, but what you want to do is make sure you're doing it in a way that I truly feeling like, this is a better path for you to take. And here's the reasons why. I wanted to just pause for a moment and let everyone know that we're going to have an extra bit of content at the end of this uh, discussion where anyone that is interested in getting uh, a 70% better connection acceptance, um, then you want to stay stay tuned for the extra bonus bit of content and you'll just have to follow the links in the show notes to be able to access that so we'll talk about that in a little bit um but you know there is there's so much to continue to explore here on on what is happening on linkedin and i just want to talk about um ai for a moment and understand from you as if i'm reading between the lines I think you know, that AI creates an opportunity to stand out, doesn't it? Because if you're, if the people are using AI, then you who are not using AI can make it very clear to the, particularly the person whose post it is, uh, that you're real and sincere. That gives you an opportunity to stand out, doesn't it? It does. It does. And I think people right now are being a little bit lazy in the way they use AI. Uh, it, it's funny that you bring that up because I, I saw a, uh, it was a YouTube video that was talking about creating a, AI content and how they could produ produce a, a really nice looking article in seconds uh, or a post or multiple posts. Uh, but when you start reading it and you go through it, you can, you can detect there's AI in there. So if you're going to use AI for one thing, what the way I do it is I'll write an entire post and then I'll go through AI and say, well, how could I improve this? And then it'll give me some suggestions, but I'm writing it. Now I've got even more direction to make it clearer or more engaging. Uh, but the AI isn't doing the writing for me. The AI is giving me some suggestions on how I can improve it. Uh, you can do that. You can use AI to help build a strategy. For example, when I mentioned this earlier, when uh, we've got these 16 different methods to get a client and then we're looking at the right combination of methods that'll give us the highest probability of getting a client, I'm using a, an AI model to help me build that path for a client. And then I'll also do a simulation. Okay, what happens if this, this method is gone? So it, now it changes our path. What do we add something? Do we to continue down this path? So we're able to predict ahead of time what our results are going to be. And we can tell if we run into a problem, we've already anticipated that. And then we can change paths or we can make an adjustment to our path. So we get, so the goal is the same in getting a client. One of the keys that you sort of glossed over a little bit there is, is you've got to track all of this, don't you? I mean, this is the this is the trick is to actually work out what is working best for you 
And the great thing is, is that you don't have to just do one method. You can try multiple different methods, but you just have to understand um, what the numbers look like. And so you ultimately know where you should be putting more of your energy into it. Right. Absolutely. As it, one of the funny things is, is, is I look at the 16 methods and we've got a probability as, 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 a, as, as far as effectiveness of each one. Uh, the top one easily is engaging with somebody else's content. The bottom one is a, a celebration post. But if you do a celebration pro post in the right way, it can be one of the best posts that you can can put out there because celebration posts get the most. Um, uh, and I won't. I don't want to say traction, but they're going to get the most impressions. Uh, if you write it correctly, you can get the most engagement. And then if you tie it to one of the other 16 methods, or maybe there's two or three, uh, that post can actually get you as many uh, opportunities to sell as anything else. But you have to understand, like, what is the, what is, what are the order that I uh, use these methods to create the path that will get me to where I want to be, i.e. get a client? Yeah, and I think it's, um, that's the, the I, I love how there's the clarity in what you're doing in terms of recognizing there are these different methodologies that you can use and that you have to understand where you're fitting into which one and what you're doing. Um, you know, as I was reading your book, one of the things that, it, you know, kept bringing through my mind was, as we kind of touched on before, was how do you send the right message to someone if you are going to direct message them? And what I found fascinating was that, um, the, the simple idea that just a thanks for connecting, if they reach out to you and connect with you, that that's enough, that you don't need the rest of it because it's not about that part of the conversation. Yeah, you don't want to show your hand too early. And I'll go back to we're just making friends. So like, I don't know where this is going to lead. Thank you for connecting with me. And I leave it at that. Uh, you'll have other opportunities to have a conversation with them. And there's going to be the right opportunity to have the, 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 the conversation with them for them to be more than just a connection. Uh, but the thing that I think most people try to do is they project this person is going to be a client uh, and all their actions show that they're trying to get them as a client. Whereas if you just leave it open and if they can be, as I mentioned, a friend, a collaboration partner, which is more valuable, in my opinion, than a client. It doesn't have the immediate results, uh, but long term, you're, it's a much more valuable relationship. Or a referral partner, again, not maybe immediate results, but long term, a better uh, position to be in, or a client. And is if you approach people in that way, and I don't know where this is going to go, but let's let's talk and get to know one another, get comfortable with one another, and then see what happens. And one of those four things are going to occur. And if you play your cards right, it's going to be one of those things where there it's it's a win win position, win win situation for the both of you. One of the things I wanted to just touch on finally, um, as I know we can talk for hours and hours here, there's a lot of stuff to unpack um, uh, in this, and I'm sure we're going to do it again. And we've talked about you know, talking in, in and, and I think this is a good example, by the way, before I even get into that question is that you and I connected on LinkedIn because of uh, someone else that I've, uh, that I connected with and who has also been a guest on the program. We connected with the simple idea of collaboration and uh, and for, you know, from friendship and collaboration, we had a, an initial uh, conversation and we just hit it off and here we are doing the podcast and I know there are other things that are going to come out of it as, as a result of that. And that's a valuable relationship and people underestimate that hugely because they're going in with this whole idea of, you know, as we even started the program, you know, when we were talking about networking, that people go in with this attitude of, who am I selling to? Yeah, you, you have to be careful with that. It, it really does put so much pressure on you and the other person that usually it doesn't turn out well. It, in, in sales, especially when you're cold 
selling somebody, more often than not, you're, it's not going to go anywhere. It, the, the odds are not in your favor. When you approach it in a way where you're open to possibilities and realize that there are other possibilities than maybe your initial one, uh, good things do happen. The other thing that I say uh, is success is a team sport. So your team members can be your clients because uh, they can refer business to you. They can do more business with you. Your employees, uh, friends that you know can then end up being people that refer business to you or collaboration partners. So you've got to look at is it, maybe if someone is, okay, where are they going to fit on my team? Uh, I don't know yet, but let's, let's figure it out. And like, how can I help them uh, in building their team? And when you're approaching things in that way, everything just seems to fall into place. I wanted to uh, ask you about one other element that you touched on a little bit earlier on, uh, Sales Navigator. And it's an interesting tool. And as you suggest, most people have that have it don't use it properly. Um, I think there's many people out there that don't have it. And I think one of the things that you need to realize if you want to get places on LinkedIn is that if you're, it's like anything, if you're using only the free tool, then you're only going to get so far. It's not that you can't do it without it. It's just that you, you, you're doing it with one hand tied behind your back. So talk to me about the value of Sales Navigator and the right way in an overall sense of how to use it. Well, Sales, sales Navigator really is essential if you're going to be serious about getting business on LinkedIn. You can get lucky and get a client here and there, uh, but you can't do it on purpose. For example, in the process that I go through, I, uh, I'm using Sales Navigator to qualify the people that I go after. I'll, I'll use an example here. Let's say that I challenge you to a game of darts, and you say, maybe you're like a dart-throwing champion. Uh, so you go, oh, this is going to be easy mark for me. So I go, okay, but two conditions. I get to pick the, the dart boards that we're going to use, um, and both yours and mine. So I give you a dart board, and it goes from floor to ceiling. It's massive. And you're thinking, oh, boy, this is going to be really easy. And then I have my dart board, which is standard size. The difference between the two is your bullseye is about the size of a pinhead. Mm -hmm. My bullseye is the entire dart board. And so the second condition is it only counts when you hit the bullseye. So I could throw mine in the dart and I'm going to hit, as long as I hit the target, I'm going to hit the bullseye every time. It's going to be close to impossible for you to hit that uh, bullseye. And that's the difference between using sales navigator and trying to find somebody without it. I can zoom in on the bullseye where it's very difficult, almost impossible for you to hit the bullseye if you're not using sales navigator. It is such a powerful tool. And yet, as you say, I don't think it's particularly well used. And I think it's also about uh, spending the time with it. I think that's the, the problem with a lot of these tools is that people go in with this, okay, it's just going to give me a whole bunch of things and spit it out really quickly because people don't want to spend the time. And I think that's the interesting thing that I've learned as well uh, along the journey with LinkedIn. And I've been you know, active on LinkedIn for a number of years now is that you go through phases where, you know, you might pump out a bit of content and it's being posted, could be by someone else. It could be being scheduled in and you, you it's, you're just going through the motions and, and it can be the same with reaching out to people. Oh, we've got a, you know, and there are various tools that are out there that are going to reach out to people for you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, find all of that so as as your book title would call it cringy um and and yet there's so much that's happening with that and i think there are there are tools out there that are that will send out birthday wishes um to people or anniversaries and things like that that are taken in there and it's so um insincere is probably the best way of describing it and people don't know where to go when you even respond to those half the time. Um, you know, I know someone that, that sort of teaches that methodology and it works well. 
uh, to it if you're sincere with it and using it as a conversation starter to re-energize connections that you might have had and you haven't spoken to in a long time. It can start a conversation again and I get it in that way. That works quite nicely. But the other people who have no intention and just send all these things out and just hope that by sending that it'll start another sales conversation. Um, to me, it just it's infuriating. And I think that's one of the problems with LinkedIn on, on the one hand is that it's a very cluttered space with people doing the wrong thing. And that's probably, I don't know what percentage of people are doing the wrong thing, but it's a pretty high percentage. Yeah. Um, and, but at the same time, it creates opportunities for those who can follow the methods that you've talked about, which is based on the idea of being friends first it's, it's an opportunity to cut through. It is. It is. I will, uh, I'll mention two things to you that, that um, um, you may question. So one of the things, and this is a fairly new thing that, that LinkedIn has changed. It's uh, in the Your Network or I think Network or My Networking tab. Uh, there is growth and there is catch up. Uh, meaning to catch up with, with one of your connections. So I think maybe that came out two or three months ago that they made that change. And so I tested it. I started to, to go to the, the catch up tab. And when somebody had an anniversary or a birthday, I would use the, the automated tab, just click, click. Uh, congratulations on your, um, your anniversary, work anniversary. And I'd send them a gift. The gift part is important. If you send just the message without the gift, it doesn't work that well. But if you send, and the silly gift, uh, is, is what I send. Like the sillier, the better, especially for the birthdays. Uh, about 10 to 20% of the people will get back to you. If you do that, it's like the easiest way to get somebody to get back to you. Uh, what you do after that is, the key to making it work. If you start pitching somebody after that, it's just absolutely the wrong way to, to, to do that. You can have a conversation with people from that, and then you just leave it at that. Like, for example, um, if, if it's somebody's birthday, I'll send the birthday wish and the gift, and uh, a lot of times they'll get back to me and say, thank you for wishing me a happy birthday. I say, oh, my pleasure. And I'll send back um, a picture of me giving a thumbs up. I've got a whole bunch of them with my hat and thumbs up thing. And that's all I do. Uh, I may come back to them three, four days later if it's in a post or maybe in a DM. And if it's in a post, I will like the post. I'll comment on the post. But then I'll go back and I'll reference their birthday. And I'll ask them, how was their birthday? And I'm doing that in the post. Uh, did, you, uh, did you go out to dinner? Did you have cake? Did you get presents? So I'll ask them one of those three questions. And they usually respond to that. Uh, from there, I can go back and DM it and, and, and talk to them a little bit more. But that's a different approach than what somebody else might do, hitting the uh, automated happy birthday um, and then maybe sending them a GIF and then transitioning to, Oh, I have this special report that I'd like you to see. But don't step on their day. Let them have their day. And then the next time you talk to them, like, what happened during your special day? They'll remember that. They'll also remember that you pitched them on their birthday and probably never do business with you at all. I think um, there's just lots of gold in all of the things that you've said along the way. Um, we have to wrap things up. So just a couple of things. To remind you. Yeah, I know. I know. We, we're definitely going to do this again um, because we could, we could talk for another couple of hours. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's the time of day where you're wrapping things up and I'm just kicking things off for the day. So uh, that's the nature of what happens when you're dealing with time zones. But a reminder to everyone, we're going to have a little bit of bonus content on how to get 70% more uh, connection acceptance. So that's something you want to stay tuned for and follow the um, uh, click on the links to be able to do that. A reminder also that we'll provide links to be able to uh, get access to the book. Uh, it's on uh, Kindle, I believe, uh, on Amazon. Yeah, uh, uh, Amazon Kindle. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that is uh, No More Cringe. In case you haven't, in case you've missed the title that I've been repeating a few times during this, it is a fantastic and very easy read. I encourage everyone that is 
listening to this, if you're listening this far, then you are 100% are interested in LinkedIn and doing it better. And it is a must read book. It won't take you very long, but you'll get lots of things out of it. I, I sat down and wrote lots and lots of notes uh, of things that I want to adjust and change as a result of it. And uh, you just keep nodding your head throughout the whole book because you think, well, this is just, it's in many respects, it's obvious, um, but it's not obvious because people aren't doing it. So um, I just wanted to uh, wrap things up and, um, and as well and say, aside from all of the different ways that people will be able to connect with you that we'll share in the, in the show notes, give me the um, two things. One is, is what's the great way that people can work with you? And secondly, uh, which is probably the most important thing, uh, the question that I like to ask everyone is, what's the aha moment that people have when they start working with you that you wish more people knew in advance so more people had come knocking on your door? The aha, aha, the aha moment is, this is not as hard as I thought it was. I've been working way too hard to get clients. Uh, that's usually the thing that people say. They'll also say, now I get it. Now I understand what I was doing wrong. So, yeah, both of those things are true. I love that. And and what's the best way that people can come and work with you? Is it start with the book? What's the best way to do it? I would start with the book. There, there's going to be on my profile, uh, probably by the time that they are watching this episode, uh, there'll be a quiz that'll be there. And it'll be like a LinkedIn IQ quiz. Uh, it'll be story based kind of like a choose your own adventure and you'll get customized uh, advice on how to adjust your approach so that you can get business on linkedin i love it it's been amazing talking to you and uh, so many great bits of advice for people and the whole philosophy of being friends first it just resonates and uh, i think it should do with you know, the majority of people out there because it's a human instinct. And uh, I appreciate the friendship that we've been able to grow, uh, not just through this podcast, but through uh, previous discussions that we've had. And I look forward to that continuing well into the future. For now, thank you for being an amazing guest on the BizBytes program. Thank you so much for having me, Anthony. It's been, uh, it's been a great pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening to BizBytes. We hope you enjoyed the program. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. BizBytes is proudly brought to you by Podcast Done For You, the service where we will deliver a podcast for you and expose your brilliance to the world. Contact us today for more information. Details in the show notes. We look forward to your company next time on BizBytes.